Yes, well, as we get older and older, I'm 77 right now. You can't live forever, you know. So if this uh, um, procedure I'm going to have to clean the blood doesn't work, then I've got probably a few more months to make it before my kidneys shut down, you know. So that's kind of why I'm kind of going along with the interview at this time. You're seeing that what you went through is just too important for people not to know about. Yeah. Yeah. C can you just, let, can we start at the beginning with your military career and just walk through what exactly your experiences were? was in the drafted into the military and got into the U.S. Army. After that, I was sent to the Signal Training Center in eastern United States. What year would this be? 58. I went through the Signal Training course. And at that time, I went through the radio teletype course and also the cryptography course, crypto. They had five instructors that were getting out of military service. So they pulled the top five students and I was third in the class. So I got pulled as an instructor. Now were you at this time also working yet for CIA? No. Not yet? No. After one day, my boss came to me, and he uh, said, uh, how would you like to, you know, make some extra money? And I said, oh, money is good. <laughs> <laughs> so he explained to me that I could, he could put it through. I could, would have to get a top secret White House Q clearance for the job, you know. And I thought, boy, must be a pretty exclusive thing, you know. And I said, well, what is this? And he said that I'm director for the CIA for Eastern United States, you know. And I said, oh, I didn't know that. And he said, you weren't supposed to. <laughs> <laughs> After about six weeks, my security clearance came through, and I got my... CIA card. It was an ID card, like a credit card, where I could just go up to the door and slice it, walk right in. And my uh, name at that time, I used a mm -hmm. artificial name, too. Never used my real name. Uh, I started working with him on the project he was on. And that was... Uh, Project Blue Book, which was kind of partially a fraud. You're saying some of the Blue Book cases were, yes. were completely fictitious? Yes. But the cases that we got came from, I think it was Fort Belleville, Maryland. Mm -hmm. Fort Belvoir? Yeah. And it didn't come from the Pentagon or it didn't come from CIA headquarters. But we would get reports about a certain sighting that they had in Mexico or 
Italy or something like that. And then we would have to, we had people that would follow through on it. They would go out and interview the people to see if they were not cases or if it was real, you know. So they'd be going overseas frequently? It, I, I wasn't, but I always stayed statewide. But uh, uh, the people we had working with us from the CIA would do that. We would get like a new report probably a couple times a week. I was coming into the Army fresh off the farm, you know, so I really didn't have much knowledge of anything, but my boss filled me in on Project Blue Book and what they had found so far, as far as uh, greys and aliens and, and the Roswell incident. How did you feel when this first got dumped on you? When you first well, learned about this? I was just kind of overwhelmed with all of this, you know. And I said to him, I don't know if I'm going to be able to be a judge of this type of thing. What's real, what's not? when I don't have much knowledge of it, you know. So... What did he say? He said, well, we have to build the information as we go, and you'll see how this thing is working out. And then the other thing is, of course, you really weren't able to tell family or, or close no, friends, obviously. No, I, I couldn't tell anybody. In fact, I, I had to take a vow that I wouldn't tell anybody, a lot of it for 40 years and more of it for 50 years, which is up in 2010. You're doing all this crypto work. You're looking at images, photographs, video. It's 1958, maybe the fall of 58. What happened after this? At that time, the Project Blue Book thing kind of went pot, you know. If you remember, back in those days, they kind of declared it as a nothing, you know. Mm -hmm. Right. And uh, they were telling the world all UFOs are misidentifications, hoaxes, yeah, balloons, yeah, psychological issues, whatever. Yes. Yeah. So my boss came to me and he says, "We've both got a new assignment." And he says, "Oh, I said, where are we going?" Oh, he says, we're going to the Capitol. We're going to be part of the Eisenhower push. He's trying to find out something about, all about these aliens that MJ-12 was supposed to find out, but never did, never sent back reports to him. MJ-12, the... UFO you, control group, were they calling it MJ-12 yes, at that time? Yes. yes. They called us in, went into the Oval Office, and Eisen, President Eisenhower was there and Nixon, and they said, uh, we called the people in from MJ-12 from Area 51 and S-4, but uh, they told us that the government had no jurisdiction over what they were doing. So being a general, past general, you didn't tell them to go to hell without any <laughs> real good reason, you know. Mm -hmm. So he said, uh, I want you and your boss to fly out there. I want you to give them a personal message. He says, I want you to tell them, whoever is in charge, tell them that to get in, they have this week, coming week, to get into Washington and to report to me. And if they don't, I'm going to get the first army from Colorado and we're going to go over, we're going to take the base over. I don't care what kind of classified material you got. We're going to rip this thing apart. Eisenhower was going to invade yes, Area, Area 51. 51. Yeah, with the First Army. 
So you go out with your superior. Yes. You fly out. You land. What happens? Can you describe this whole process? What you saw? It took us the 13 or 15 miles south to S4 and like different garage door openings. Okay. And in these garage door openings, they had like different saucer crafts. The very first one had uh, the uh, Roswell craft in. It was kind of crashed up, but apparently every alien that was in a died except for a couple. So you see the Roswell craft, and what are some of the others that you see? Well, the Roswell craft was really strange because it looked like real heavy aluminum foil. <laughs> we could rock next to it, and you could rock it. The whole thing probably weighed 150, 300 pounds. Could they tell what the source of power was of this craft? Yeah, it was a like a river's gravitational thing of some kind. In fact, one later on, I got I got the the uh, mathematical code for recursing gravity in a three by five card. I, I guess there are different types of mm -hmm. grays and so on. How did you see that evidence? Well, at the, uh, later on, at, at S4, we viewed the autopsy film. And then the colonel said, what we've got in here is we're interviewing a gray alien. All right, right there. H how did you feel at that moment? Well, I thought, boy, we had no idea we were going to see the real thing. All we saw was film. Yeah. <laughs> you had to have a little bit of heart racing yes. at that moment. My boss was able to go in and had a, like a partial interview with him. So what did this gray alien look like? Could you describe him a little bit? This one looked a little bit oriental. So I'm, I'm just wondering, if, if it looked almost human, what about this didn't look human? No, it didn't look human as far as the skin tone and basically the shape of it and the size. How was its head size compared with a normal human, for example? Uh, brain was kind of a little bit bigger. Mm -hmm. And some of them nose was very, very small, and the ears were just like holes. Mouth was very small. Now, why were they bringing you out here at all, anyway, to see an alien? What was the point? To go back and tell the president they actually had one. So he did not know at this point no. if there was an alien no. at S4? No. What did you do then at area? Were you done, or did you have other things to do? Yeah, so basically we were kind of done. Went back to Area 51. Mm -hmm. They took us into the main building, and there we saw a U-2, which, of course, we didn't know existed. Mm -hmm. And a, uh, a model of the SR-71. Yeah, the Blackbird. So... But like I mentioned earlier, it was not a model of the current Blackbird. Early, but it was later an earlier Blackbird, version. But an early version. Did you go directly to Washington after this? Yes. Or did you go somewhere else? How did they get, did you fly we regular airline? Flew, or? We flew back to, to uh, the commuter plane, back to the air base, mm -hmm. and then took President Eisenhower's Lockheed Electra back to Washington. You and your supervisor, yeah. superior officer, and now you're meeting with the president? Yes. Can you describe this? Well, we met with him in, uh, boy, the second story of the, the old OSS warehouse building. And uh, 
Eisenhower and Nixon were there, and uh, also Hoover was there. So he asked us what was going on, and we told him about the alien whole situation and the uh, black projects and so on. And he was just totally shocked. He appeared for the first time to be uh, worried, mm -hmm. you know, like he was worried. I would think that Eisenhower would, I mean, he certainly knew that flying saucers were real. Yes. He knew that there were aliens. So I guess I'm just wondering, what would he have been, you know, really surprised about? Uh, surprised about the black programs. Eisenhower mm -hmm. said, got to keep this thing completely secret. Mm -hmm. You know, can't talk about this. Your actual name is... I mean, the name you grew up with, I that was a different name than what yes. you had in the... I never, never so. used it in the CIA at all. Now, what about today? You're going on the public record, and this is still sensitive information, even though earlier you talked about, you know, security oaths that maybe expire after a certain period of time. 50 years. But you're still concerned. Linda Moulton Owl's phone call... Her phone was tapped, and they got my phone number, and through the telephone company, they were able to find me, and so on. When they found you, what happened? I was going to a grocery store. Two guys in a black suits come out of a black Lincoln town car and came over to see me, mm -hmm. and they told me that I better not publish anything, or talk to Linda about any more things. So at that time, I did, you know, I, did, I stopped. That was enough to intimidate you? Yes. Rather remain anonymous. Never show my face on anything. Really, thank you for doing this. Yes. This was, I guess, kind of a good idea because I feel much better having talked about it. I kind of feel like there's a load off my shoulders. You know? Really? Because uh, I had an awful lot of secrets that I had kept over the years.